In this section, I'm going to cover phase changes and phase diagrams. Molecules in the liquid state are constantly in motion. The average kinetic energy is proportional to the temperature, so we've talked about that before, that um, the motion of particles is a, a function of their temperature, and the higher the temperature is, the faster the particles move, the more kinetic energy they have. Um, however, some molecules may have more kinetic energy than the average, and others have less. So the temperature is just the average kinetic energy, um, but that doesn't mean that all molecules in the sample have the same kinetic energy. Some are moving faster and some are moving slower. So here is um, a representation of water molecules in the liquid phase. So um, you can see that they kind of jostle around and they're, they're kind of stuck together. And if we heat them up, then we can give, uh, we can increase the average kinetic energy. You see they start to move a little bit faster. And some of the particles are moving faster than others. You can see that some of them are kind of spinning around in circles. And some of them are barely moving at all. So you can see that some of the particles have a higher kinetic energy than others. What you also start to see here is that as I heat this up, some of the particles are kind of at the edge. They kind of bump around at the edge, and sometimes they can get knocked off of this of the water droplet. And when a particle gets knocked off of the water droplet and kind of floats away here and floats out into space, that's evaporation. So the water molecules here move around. They're in constant motion, and sometimes the the water molecules that are at the surface can escape. They get enough kinetic energy to actually escape the intermolecular forces of their neighbors. The hydrogen, they can break away from the hydrogen bonds and they kind of float away into space. And um, that's uh, what we would call evaporation. And then you see that sometimes these evaporated particles come back down to the water drop and they kind of get stuck in the water droplet. And they, they get sucked back in, and from there they're stuck, and they, um, they have their hydrogen bonds have reconnected, and they're kind of stuck to their neighbors. So that's condensation. So you can see this is a pretty accurate molecular representation of evaporation and condensation. Now the particles um, are mostly stuck together in the water droplet, but sometimes some of them can bounce off and evaporate, and then they can come back down and condense. The average number of particles that are in the vapor phase um, at a given temperature is uh, going to be constant. So what that means is that if I have, let's say right now there looks like there's about five or six particles that are evaporated, as those particles condense, others will evaporate so that we ha always have about five or six um, vapor molecules. And this is what we call dynamic equilibrium. So for every one particle that evaporates, there's one particle that condenses. So the average number of particles in the liquid state and the average number of particles in the gas state is constant when we have reached equilibrium. If I increase the temperature, then I've given the particles more kinetic energy, and then more of them are now have sufficient kinetic energy to break away from their neighbors, the ones at the surface. So even more particles are evaporating at this point. So um, it will take a while to reach equilibrium again. Um, and when I do reach equilibrium, there will be more molecules in the gas phase. So I, I had five or six before. Maybe I'll have 10 now that I've increased the temperature. At some point, as I keep increasing the temperature, you see that a lot of them are still condensed. They're still stuck together like this. When they look like they're stuck together like this, then I know that I still have water. It's still liquid water. But it's getting hot. It's getting near the boiling point. This is not accurate because you know the boiling point of water is really 373 Kelvin. So if I was at 432, then certainly this should be gas by that point. But this, um, this simulation isn't 100% physically realistic, but it's pretty close. So let's push the gas button and see what changes. So looking at gas now, particles, because there's so many of them, they condense for a moment, they get all in the same area, but they're not really sticking to each other. They're kind of acting more like pool balls, like balls on a pool table, where they get close to each other and then they kind of bounce apart and they bounce into each other and then they go their separate ways again. So in a gas, 
um, the particles are have they all have sufficient kinetic energy to break the hydrogen bonds from their neighbors and to break apart and to not be stuck together anymore. So that's the difference between a solid, where all those the particles don't have very much kinetic energy at all. They don't move very quickly, so they're stuck to their neighbors. Those hydrogen bonds are stru stuck very strongly, about four hydrogen bonds per water molecule. Two hydrogen bonds from the oxygen and two hydrogen bonds from the hydrogen. So there's about four hydrogen bonds per water molecule in a solid. And then in a liquid, at least one of those hydrogen bonds has broken. So on average in a liquid, um, a water molecule might be experiencing one or two or three hydrogen bonds. It's definitely, each water molecule definitely has at least one hydrogen bond because look, they're stuck. These ones that are on the surface do not have enough energy to get away, so they're stuck to their neighbors with hydrogen bonds. In a gas, there are no more hydrogen bonds. By the time I have increased the temperature of a substance to the point of it boiling, the boiling point represents the point at which each molecule has sufficient kinetic energy to break the intermolecular forces of its neighbor. So substances like water that have hydrogen bonds, that have strong intermolecular forces, this takes a lot of energy to break these molecules apart. So water has a relatively high boiling point. But some substances that have really weak intermolecular forces, like nonpolar substances, um, they do not require very much temperature, very much heat, in order to um, gain sufficient kinetic energy to break apart from their neighbors, so they have a much lower boiling point. So um, the larger the surface area, the faster the rate of evaporation. So particles are always jostling around, but they can only escape, they can only evaporate from the surface of the liquid. So during evaporation, if I have um, uh, the larger the surface area, the more particles uh, there are that are capable of breaking apart from their neighbors and becoming gas particles, more capable of evaporating. So when I look at a sample of particles bouncing around like this, this is a distribution of their kinetic energy as a function of how, how many molecules have a certain kinetic energy. So the higher the peak goes, the more uh, molecules under that peak have a kinetic energy at that level. So if I look at this blue peak right here, this is the top of the peak and that um, corresponds to a kinetic energy right about here on the axis. This red peak has a peak that's lower, so there's a, a, a smaller fraction of molecules, but the kinetic energy at that peak is higher. So at a low temperature, what we can see is that most of the particles, a larger proportion of the particles, all have the same kinetic energy. And as I increase the temperature, the, uh, the peak moves from here to here. So you can see that on average, the particles um, gain more kinetic energy, but also they spread out. So here, in a, we can, I'll draw another peak to show an even more extreme version. If we were at an even lower temperature, then the peak might look like this. And so at this temperature, I have a very small distribution. Particles can have this much kinetic energy or all the way up to this much kinetic energy, and that's 100% of the particles. This is the only range of kinetic energy available to those particles that are at a really low temperature. But if I heat it up even higher than that one, then I might have a peak that looks like this. So when it's really cold, I only have a range of kinetic energy that's available to those particles that's very small. But this one is the highest temperature, and so look at the range of kinetic energies that are available to those particles. And what that means is that when a sample is really cold, all of the particles are going at about the same speed. They're all traveling at about the same speed. But when a sample is really hot, like this curve right here, some of the particles are not moving very much at all in a very hot sample. But some of the particles are moving really, 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 really fast, have a lot of kinetic energy.
On average, most of the particles have about this much kinetic energy. But you can see that as I heat, as I heat a sample up and the temperature becomes higher and higher and higher, not only um, are the, does the average kinetic energy of all the particles increase, but the distribution of kinetic energy available to each particle also increases. So we can see, for example, right here, look at this one, it's barely moving. Well, let's find another one. This one, he's almost stopped. That one has almost no kinetic energy. But look at this one that's spinning like crazy. When they're spinning really, really fast, that's a representation of rotational energy. And particles that spin really fast have more energy than particles that aren't spinning at all. So you can see in this distribution of molecules, the average kinetic energy is 430 Kelvin, and some of the particles are not moving at all. And some of the particles are moving very, very quickly. So that's what we're seeing here. At a very high temperature, some particles are almost stopped, some particles are going a medium speed, and some particles are going really, really fast. A very small portion of particles are going very, very fast. So again, condensation is just the opposite of evaporation. Um, as molecules gain enough kinetic energy to break apart from their neighbors and they travel um, into the air, they will then trade energy with the air and maybe that particle will lose enough energy so that as it uh, um, travels back down to the liquid, if it gets close enough to form hydrogen bonds with the water molecules on the surface of the liquid, then that particle will become captured and it will get stuck again. And that's called condensation. So again, we see here that evaporation and condensation are opposite forces. So when we're looking at a liquid and we heat it up so that some of the particles have enough kinetic energy to evaporate, um, as soon as some of the particles evaporate, then those particles, will, some of them, will come back down to the bulk of the sample and they'll condense. Right? So some will break free and then some get stuck back again. So evaporation and condensation are, um, are forces that are um, kind of moving in opposite directions. So the weaker the attractive forces, the faster the rate of evaporation. So I just talked about this in reference to their boiling points, that when substances have very weak intermolecular forces like dispersion forces, because they're nonpolar, then those will have a very low boiling point. I don't have to put in much energy to break those dispersion forces and, and break those particles apart from each other to turn them from a liquid to a gas. But for particles that have hydrogen bonds that are stuck together with really strong intermolecular forces, it takes more energy to break them apart and so they have a higher boiling point. So the same can be said about evaporation. The weaker the attractive forces, like nonpolar substances, that have dispersion forces will evaporate very quickly. And maybe you've seen this, if you've ever spilled gasoline um, at the gas station, I guess here in Oregon you don't pump your own gas. Where I'm from you actually had to pump gasoline. But if, you, if you've ever seen gasoline or paint thinner or um, some of those really smelly organic solvents, um, chemical solvents that you might find in a garage or something, if you've ever seen any of those spilled, they evaporate very quickly. Um, and that's because they're nonpolar substances and they have a very, the particles that are in the liquid are held together very weakly. And so it doesn't take much energy for them to evaporate or to boil. Water, on the other hand, if you spill water, it can take a really, really long time for that water to evaporate. So um, the stronger the intermolecular forces, the slower the rate of evaporation. And the weaker the attractive forces, the faster the rate of evaporation. Substances like gasoline that evaporate very easily are said to be volatile, but um, liquids that do not evaporate easily are called non-volatile, like water. So um, remember way back in chapter four when we talked about um, exothermic and endothermic processes. So remember exo means to exit and thermic means heat. So in an exothermic process, heat is exiting. And when heat exits, something gets hot. Exothermic reactions 
or feel hot if you touch the, the reaction flask. An endothermic reaction, endo means to enter, and thermic means heat, so in an endothermic reaction, heat is entering the reaction, and when heat enters the reaction, um, that makes something feel cold. So for example, if you're holding a reaction flask and an endothermic process is occurring, that flask is going to feel cold because as the heat enters, it, it entering the reaction, where does the heat entering the reaction come from? It comes from your hand. It's the reaction, as it, as it uses the heat from the environment, uh, pulls the heat out of your hand as well. So uh, when, um, a, when, some, when water molecules evaporate, that's an endothermic process. So um, endothermic processes are ones that, uh, where heat enters. And the reason that heat is going to enter a reaction is because we need energy in order for something to happen. So um, when water molecules are stuck together, and they're trying to break to break all of the hydrogen bonds so that they can be free from each other so that uh, the water molecule can float away from the group then that's going to require energy to break those hydrogen bonds so that's why as we heat up a substance we're giving the substance more energy and those bonds are breaking and the liquid will turn into a gas so um, similarly, if a sample is, is at room temperature and I'm not giving it any energy, then as the particles evaporate, they are taking the kinetic energy from that sample or from the, um, from the surroundings, so from the flask or from the table or from the air. And um, in order to break the hydrogen bonds from the neighbors, that requires some energy. So. Um, Evaporation is an endothermic process requiring energy to break those bonds. Condensation, on the other hand, when a molecule is in the vapor phase and then it floats back down and the water molecules capture it and form hydrogen bonds to that gas particle and it becomes a liquid particle, it turns from a gas into a liquid, that's an exothermic process. So that, in that case, the um, when I make a bond, the energy that, that the gas particle had, the extra energy that the gas particle had that it no longer has, because now it's a liquid, it's not a gas anymore, that extra energy has to go somewhere. So it's transferred to the environment, to the surroundings. So one way to remember endothermic and exothermic is to remember that um, when something, when a bond is being broken, that takes energy. So breaking a bond takes energy, that's endothermic. But when I make a bond, that releases energy, and making a bond releasing energy is exothermic. So when something evaporates, I'm breaking the hydrogen bonds. That requires energy, endothermic. When a particle condenses, I'm making bonds. That releases energy, so that's exothermic. So we can measure the heat that's required to break those intermolecular forces in a liquid and turn a liquid into a gas. And we call that the heat of vaporization. So remember this H is enthalpy. So delta H is the change in enthalpy. And this VAP is the change in enthalpy during the process of vaporization. And we call that the heat of vaporization or sometimes called the enthalpy of vaporization. So evaporating is always endothermic. It always takes energy to break the intermolecular forces between particles. Even if it's a small amount of energy because those particles are nonpolar and the intermolecular forces are very weak, it still takes some energy. So let's look down here. Water has a fairly high boiling point and water, H2O, is capable of hydrogen bonding and hydrogen bonds are the strongest intermolecular force. So when liquid water molecules, H2O particles that are stuck together with hydrogen bonds, in order for all those hydrogen bonds to break and those liquid particles to become gas particles, that takes 40.7 kilojoules per mole uh, of energy, of heat, in order to break um, 
water molecules apart. Diethyl ether is a molecule that has an oxygen atom and a hydrogen atom, a ten of them, but it doesn't. It's not capable of hydrogen bonding because of the way that these um, atoms are arranged. So there, in order for a hydrogen bond to form, I needed O and next to an H. But in this compound, the O is next to a carbon on this side and it's next to a carbon on the other side. So this oxygen atom doesn't have a hydrogen atom next to it. So diethyl ether cannot hydrogen bond. Diethyl ether has a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. So when two molecules, or when a, a mole, when a mole of diethyl ether is boiling, I have to break all of the dipole-dipole interactions in order for those liquid diethyl ether molecules to become gaseous diethyl ether molecules. Because dipole-dipole forces are weaker than hydrogen bonds, it takes less energy. It takes 26.5 kilojoules per mole to boil a mole of diethyl ether, and it takes 40.7 kilojoules to boil a mole of water to break all of those hydrogen bonds and turn a mole of liquid water into a mole of gaseous water. Um, and we can see that here in their boiling points too. The amount of energy that it's going to take to boil a mole of that substance is, um, sh is a function of its boiling point. The higher the boiling point, the more energy it takes to break those apart. So we can see here that um, heat of vaporization decreases and so does the boiling point of these substances. So we looked at this situation before. Dynamic equilibrium oops, is what we call the situation when the amount of uh, the number of particles that are in that are evaporating is equal to the amount of particles, the number of particles that are condensing. So remember when I give this some heat, originally um, at the initially at the outset of this when I give it heat I'm going to increase the rate of evaporation because um, I'm going to add more kinetic energy and the particles will be able to break away from their neighbors more easily um, and over time those particles that had evaporated and become gas they're going to find their way back down to the liquid and they're going to condense and become liquid particles again so if I start with a uh, beaker of water and I put the lid on, then that beaker of water is at room temperature and I'm not adding any heat. The rate of evaporation is going to be constant in a sample of a sealed flask of water that I'm not heating because the rate of evaporation is a function of the temperature. And if the temperature is constant, then the amount of energy the kinetic energy in the sample is constant, and if the kinetic energy is constant, then I'm always going to have the same number of particles evaporate. However, if I just put the lid on, then when, right at the moment that I put the lid on, none of those particles are condensing. They've started to evaporate, but none of them have bounced off the lid and made their way back to the liquid. See, in order for these to condense, they have to bounce off the lid and then come back down to the liquid and get trapped. So that takes some time. So some of them evaporate, there's only you know, one, there's one particle in the gas phase, two particles, three particles, four particles, five particles, six particles. And then here, one of those particles has uh, condensed. And now it's, it went from a gas to a liquid, and another one, and another one, and another one. And right here, at the point at which the rate of condensation, because as more particles evaporate, more particles are going to condense, and at some point, I'm going to reach a point at which the rate of evaporation and the rate of condensation are equal. And we call that dynamic equilibrium. And what that means is that, let's say the rate of evaporation is five molecules per minute. Well, down here, it's one molecule per minute, and then two molecules per minute condensing, and then three molecules per minute, and then four molecules per minute, and finally, five molecules per minute. So when five molecules per minute are condensing, and five molecules per minute are evaporating, then I've reached dynamic equilibrium. And what that means is that the number of particles in the gas phase is constant, and the number of particles in the liquid phase is constant. But as we can see from what's happening up here, the ones that are in the liquid are not always the same. If I, let's start with a pure liquid again and just have a couple evaporate here. 
the ones that are evaporating, even though it will always be constant, let's say, for example, there's only going to be three vapor particles, they're not always the same three. Because watch, this one that's a gas, it's going to come back down, and now it's a liquid, it's not a gas anymore. And the next one that becomes a gas, this one up here, it's not the same one that just became a liquid, it's a different one. So even though I'm going to have the same number, um, maybe five gas particles, they're always a different five particles because they're always condensing and evaporating and changing places. You can see you put the lid on, there are, there's some particles evaporating but none condensing and over time I've got some evaporating and some condensing and then after, over, after I leave it for a while I have five per, mol, five per minute that evaporate and five per minute that condense and they're kind of just moving in constant motion and always trading places. Vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by the vapor above a liquid. So when I have um, a sealed vapor pressure is the pressure exerted by the vapor when it is in dynamic equilibrium with its liquid. So if I have a sample of liquid in a flask and I put the lid on and I leave it there for 5 or 10 or 15 minutes until equilibrium is established, then if I measure the pressure of gas that exists above that liquid, that's called the vapor pressure. So um, substances that have very strong intermolecular forces like water, they are going to have some particles evaporate and some particles condense. But because the intermolecular forces in water are so strong, there are not going to be very many particles that evaporate. Most of them are going to be stuck because those hydrogen bonds are really sticky. But if I have a nonpolar substance in a flask and I put the lid on, then there are going to be a lot more of those particles in the vapor phase. Remember the gasoline. Gasoline turns from a liquid into a vapor very easily. If you spill some on the ground, it evaporates almost instantly. So if you have some of it in a flask and you put the lid on, a lot of it is going to evaporate and turn into a gas. So substances that are volatile, that have weak intermolecular forces, are going to boil at a lower point, and they're also going to have a higher vapor pressure. Vapor pressure, remember, is how much gas exists above the liquid. Well, a substance where the particles are not very sticky are already have a lot of gas. They're almost a gas already if they're not very sticky. So the vapor pressure is going to be very high. So polar substances, strong intermolecular forces, high boiling points, low vapor pressure. But nonpolar substances have weak intermolecular forces, they have low boiling points, and they have high vapor pressure. So if I have, if I've reached dynamic equilibrium and I change the volume of the container, then I'm going to uh, upset that equilibrium. So if we're looking at this situation here, the arrows represent uh, how much evaporation and how much condensation. So the arrows are the same size, so this is representing that I have this many evaporating and this many condensing, and they're equal. So I'm at equilibrium, dynamic equilibrium. If I change the volume of the container and I lift this piston up, and now there's more space in here than there was before, now the rate of evaporation is, is the same because the rate of evaporation is based on the temperature and the amount of surface area, and that didn't change. So that's going to stay the same, but now the rate of condensation is smaller because these particles have way more space to travel in, and so here they're just kind of bouncing up and down, right back to the liquid. But here they've got to bounce all the way around this room, this bigger room, before they get down to the liquid. So I've decreased the rate of uh, condensation. And so it's going to take a while for dynamic equilibrium to be restored. I'm going to have to wait and um, more will have to evaporate 
and when more evaporates, then more will condense, and eventually those will be equal again. And I can do the opposite and decrease the volume in the container, which means that there that then I'm forcing all of these gas particles back into the liquid, so the condensation increases, and the rate of evaporation wouldn't actually get smaller, like it shows here, because again, we're not changing the temperature in the surface area, but the rate of condensation would be much larger, is what they're trying to show. So when conditions change, the system shifts its position to relieve or reduce the effects of the change. Or put another way, a system that's at equilibrium, if you disturb that equilibrium by changing the volume, for example, or by changing the temperature, for example, eventually that equilibrium is going to be restored. So if you leave a system there for long enough, it will come to equilibrium again. Increasing the temperature increases the number of molecules able to escape the liquid because we're increasing the kinetic energy. So the net result is that as the temperature increases, the vapor pressure increases. So if I increase the, the temperature and more and more particles evaporate, then I am, have more particles above that are uh, above that liquid, and measuring the pressure of those particles gives me the vapor pressure. So um, even small changes in temperature can make big changes in vapor pressure, uh, but that's dependent on how strong the intermolecular forces are in that substance. So here is, again, diethyl ether. This has a dipole-dipole force. There's no hydrogen bonding in diethyl ether. Um, ethyl alcohol has, um, has two hydrogen bonds. Water has four hydrogen bonds. And ethylene glycol has eight hydrogen bonds. So zero hydrogen bonds, two hydrogen bonds, four hydrogen bonds, eight hydrogen bonds. And you can see here that the vapor pressure is on this axis. And so what we see is with diethyl ether, as I increase the temperature from zero to 20, I have doubled the vapor pressure. And from 20 to 40, I've pretty much doubled the vapor pressure again. So I double the temperature and I double the vapor pressure. With uh, ethyl alcohol, if I go from, from 0 to 20, the vapor pressure has increased very little. From 20 to 40, it's increased very little again. From 40 to 60, it's increased very little again. But as I start to approach the boiling point, then a, a shift in temperature is going to make um, is going to free up a lot of those particles. A lot of them will start to evaporate and get closer and closer to the boiling point until I reach this point right here. And then um, the, this is the um, atmospheric pressure. So when a substance reaches atmospheric pressure, 760 torr, that substance will boil and all of the intermolecular forces will break. So it takes this much energy to break dipole-dipole forces, this much energy to break two hydrogen bonds, this much energy to break four hydrogen bonds, and ethylene glycol is way off the charts here. It would be way up here somewhere. So substances that are nonpolar, like or less polar, like diethyl ether, has a big change in vapor pressure as a function of temperature. Substances that are very, very polar, like water and ethylene glycol, have a very small change in vapor pressure until I get close to the boiling point and then it starts to increase exponentially. So the boiling point is when the temperature of a liquid reaches a point where the vapor pressure, so the pressure of the vapor above the liquid, is the same as the external pressure. So in this case, the external pressure is atmospheric pressure. So one atmosphere, or 760 torr, or 760 millimeters of mercury, when I can measure the pressure of the vapor above a liquid and it's equal to that atmospheric pressure, well, that means the liquid is boiling. The normal boiling point is the temperature at which the vapor pressure of the liquid equals one atmosphere. The lower the external pressure, the lower the boiling point of the liquid. So what this means is that um, when you go uh, really high into a mountain, 
if you're really if you're on a really tall mountain like Mount Everest or something, then there's n the external pressure of the atmosphere is lower. So you can imagine that the atmosphere has a weight, and it's weird to think of it that way um, because we can't feel the air pushing down on our bodies, but it really is pushing down on your body. That the the weight of the atmosphere pushing down on you because of gravity is actually a lot of pressure. Imagine going down to the bottom of the ocean. The weight of all that water pushing on you would literally crush your body. So in the same sense, the air, we're at the bottom of an ocean of air. So it doesn't weigh as much as water, but it still weighs something, and we are under some pressure being at the bottom of an ocean of air, especially when we're down here at sea level. But if you're up on a mountain, then that you're not at the bottom of the ocean of air. You're maybe in the middle of the ocean of air. Or depending on how high you are, maybe you're close to the top of the ocean of air. So the weight of the air on your body is less. The pressure of the atmosphere is less on your body. This is why when you go into a plane, they have to pressurize the cabin because you get so, you're so, your altitude is so high, you're so high up in the sky that there's not as much air pushing down on you and the pressure is lower. So what that means is that if a, if a liquid boils when its vapor pressure equals the external pressure and the external pressure goes down as you increase in altitude, then that means the boiling point of water goes down as you increase in altitude. It's kind of counterintuitive to think of it like that, but that's when you're at sea level and you put a thermometer in boiling water, the thermometer says 100 degrees. But if you're on Mount Everest and you put a thermometer in boiling water, the thermometer says 78 degrees because that water is boiling at a lower temperature. And if you go into outer space, the point at which water would boil would be even less because there's negligible pressure in outer space. Now water would still be stuck together. Water droplets can exist in space, but they have a very, very low boiling point because there's no pressure pushing those particles together. They're only being held together based on their intermolecular forces.